thank you for joining us for this design visualization and visual effect creation webinar, which will be presented by Autodesk. This webinar will explore how effective communication is key to selling a particular design internally, and will provide you with the necessary tools to get your vision across. The webinar will focus on scene setup in Autodesk Showcase, with an emphasis on materials, cross-sections, and environments. Kevin Ketchum, Autodesk Automotive Design Solutions Engineer, will be our host today. He's a well-established digital artist who has experience working for various consumer products and automotive manufacturers, and he's also the former president of the Industrial Design Society of America. Over the course of his career, Kevin used various software packages to create commercial artwork used for print, online, and broadcast promotional material. Before we start, I'd like to remind all of you in attendance to draft up some questions which Kevin will answer in the Q&A session following his presentation. Please ask these questions by typing them into the box in the lower right-hand side of your screen. If you experience any technical issues during this session, please also type these into the Q&A box and our team will do their best to sort these out for you. If you're using a PC, be sure to check that the audio is not in mute mode. We hope you'll find this webinar stimulating and informative. I'll now hand it over to Kevin so he can begin the presentation. Kevin? Well, thank you, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending this morning, this afternoon, and this evening. Um, again, my name is Kevin Ketchum and with Autodesk, and um, we would like to walk you through over the next 40 minutes um, ways to create compelling imagery using Showcase, Autodesk Showcase. And in this case, we're using the uh, professional version, but everything I'm showing you today can be done in the regular Showcase uh, version. Um, some of the questions that I get asked uh, about Showcase is, how do I create um, good environments if I don't have any HDR um, images, or how do I create my own background images and or uh, create some stunning animation. So I just wanted you to know that uh, right now, because we're broadcasting over the web, the frame rates won't be uh, 30 frames a second. Just realize that uh, um, we're dealing with the internet and the um, across the globe here. So on my end, we're, we're streaming at about uh, 28 frames per second right now. And just to give you a heads up about this model, um, this asset is fairly complete. It is a uh, about a six million polygon um, wire file, excuse me, uh, polygon data set that was translated from a wire data set. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is uh, we can bring in multiple file formats. So if I go ahead and just give you a heads up here, if you look at the file formats that we import, if I say import model, you'll be able to see that we import wire files, um, inventor files, native CATIA v4 and v5 file formats. Um, CSV files, so if you have any um, any Cosmos scene binary files, um, just know that I just um, Step Pro Engineer, those file formats come in natively, and so we import just about uh, every file format that is a main and main cat system. So this file also just wanted to point out here is it's tessellated quite high, and you can see that um, with high tessellation, you have nice radiuses, so there's no faceting in the highlight when we look at the surface. So that's just uh, something to be aware of when you're tessellating your model, when you're bringing in your wire data or um, any native CAD data, you can um, tessellate to the level that is needed. So in this case, we're looking at a hardware shaped model, and we're not ray tracing currently. So everything you see right now is baked um, for the, with hardware shading turned on. And so we have GPU and we also have CPU um, processes that we're using. So right now we're using the hardware shading, off, we're using the GPU, and when we ray trace, we'll be using the CPU. But when you're presenting live, um, to have the best frame rates, um, sometimes using a hardware shade mode uh, seems to uh, wind up being the best solution because you can react to the speed of conversation. So for instance, if we want to change this body color or change geometry, we can do that quite quickly. So if I switch this to like a silver, um, because we're in hardware shade mode, we can react quickly um, based on the conversation. Let's see it in red, let's see it in white. What you're seeing me select on the right hand side are called alternatives. And these alternatives can be uh, made for geometry, for colors and materials, and also position. So we can have um, the tires move. So in this case, I have 
uh, align my wheels to be straight by just selecting the geometry and setting a pivot here to move the geometry based on a pivot. And then what we can do is uh, I'll go ahead and toggle that off here. But just know that we can set up alternatives for paint, for materials, and for models. And so being able to set doors open and being able to rotate uh, seats to show folding and functionality that is a great thing to do in the alternatives. So I've made these alternatives. We'll make some here in just a minute. Just kind of giving you a uh, lay of the landscape here inside a showcase. Um, what we see in the background, of course, is a, an HDR that's been HDRI image that's been mapped onto some geometry. You can create your own geometry inside a showcase. So we could model um, a sphere or a cube or any geometry that you'd like to make and bake the textures onto that environment and bring it in into showcase via an APF file and load that custom geometry. So in this case, I see that I have this environment. And this environment is actually what is um, we have also created reflection maps for the geometry to see. So from the HDR that's mapped onto the, the APF file, they've extracted three images of reflection, a diffuse, and a highlight image. Um, these are .exr files. And that's what's giving us our lighting information on the geometry. Once I hit ray trace mode, and that's the letter R for ray tracing, we we'll and turn that on. Just showing you the differences between hardware shading and ray tracing. We can quickly um, cycle between the two. Um, if you're doing a real-time presentation, again, it's best to use the hardware presentation mode. Um, but if you're doing stills for print, web, and catalog, um, go ahead. You, ray tracing is, is the higher order of rendering, and that's where you'd like to go. So I'll turn on the ray tracing mode. And for those of you that don't use Showcase, just know that um, we use a subsampling rendering engine. So we start out kind of at the lowest order. And let me show you what that looks like real quick. So we start out here with subsample. So we take 16 pixels um, while we're dynamically moving the file around. We take those 16 pixels and render the average color of those 16 pixels. And then it resolves the image um, that it renders each pixel, a sample of each single pixel up to four times. And of course, we can move that up for a higher image uh, fidelity. Um, but for this interactive kind of presentation, and because we're working over the web, I'll just kind of keep it at these lower speeds so um, you have some sort of, not, not too big of a delay. Also, just know that we can play with how many bounces and refraction uh, um, effects that you have on transparent items. So in the front here, we have this Lexan and uh, the lens and the glass here. These are, are being affected by um, the refraction, refraction and, and angle of um, refractive, reflective index uh, chart. So that's, this is the number that we'll use to make things look um, translucent and transparent. And the higher the bounces, um, the more accurate, uh, more photography um, accurate it, it will be. So I'll turn that off right now. So just know, again, that's the letter R toggles on the hardware shading and toggles on the ray tracing. So that's just a toggle hitting the letter R. So we have our environment. We have this model. I talked to you about the polygon count and just to see how many polygons we have in this scene here. Um, this scene has about uh, 7 million polygons for this model. So currently, that's what I have in the scene. So it's a pretty complete data set. So we get a lot of questions. How big of a file can you load? Um, this is pretty comprehensive. We do have a full interior inside here, so the gauges and seats and all the components are loaded in this file. So we have our environment, we have our geometry, and now we want to go ahead and start creating some images. Well, usually that uh, is all based on the artist and the direction that you're getting. And we start out with doing this angle hunting. So um, I like this view here. Let's go ahead and kind of get down low here. So to create these angles, we call this shot hunting or angle hunting, I'll hit the letter, uh, the control and the letter T. So we create what's called a shot. And this is the equivalent of just kind of taking some bookmarks of the vehicle. And I'll go ahead and hit another control T. And this just created another shot. So these we can come back to at any time. I kind of like this view. It's pretty dramatic. And uh, just know that we can also play with the uh, wide angle or telephoto um, settings of the lens here. So we can kind of get close. A little bit of drama. We can also rotate the lens a little bit. Excuse me, rotate the camera. A little tilt here, and I'll control T, and I like that. So these are shots that I'm making. 
And again, that's control and the letter T to create these shots. To preview those shots on a list here, if you hit the letter T, um, just know that we now have this stack of these bookmarked images that we have just created. So um, here's the, the last two shots that we just created. So creating shots um, are a nice way to do this angle hunting and um, you know, being able to set up the view and we like the drama, we like the images. Now what can we do with these? These images can be rendered out so I can say, let's go ahead and say save out the image here, save out the image, and just know that we can save out this image based on um, whatever your desires are. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and set up like a um, this little uh, HD res here, so 1920 by 1080. And notice now you'll see the stone gate on screen. And let's say our negative space isn't quite what we were hoping for. We still have the ability to adjust the composition of the shot um, while we're in this um, image preview. And I'll go ahead and set our resolution here, 300 dpi. And uh, because we're not ray tracing, these uh, options here are grayed out. And I'll go ahead and just save this image. I'll save it to my desktop, and I'll call this test. Um, five. All right, and we'll go ahead and say save. So this is a hardware shade image. Uh, these are my thumbnails that I quickly need to get out. And a lot of times I, I will take this image into Photoshop and or to any other 2D application and add what I need to add to it. So sometimes the reflections are a little too hot. And I'll go ahead and go into Photoshop here and open that file. So let's just go to my desktop here. It looks like test five is right there. And because we rendered out a TIFF image, we get an alpha channel. So if I go here, just know that rendering out a TIFF image now gives us an alpha channel. And when I go ahead and select that alpha channel, I'll come back here and toggle that off. Now I've got a perfect selection of the geometry in the scene. So if you zoom in here, um, you can see that we have a nice clean selection. So that's what that alpha channel does for us. And of course now, we can put that or copy that and put that on a new layer, which we'll do. And my background, let's say that my background was too blurry. And I really wasn't liking um, the kind of the low res and the stretching of the sphere or the geometry that we're sitting inside of. So this is where I would probably bring in an image. So I'll say, um, let's open up a high res backplate. So to do that, I'm going to open up a high res backplate. So let's say I've created a directory here a high-res backplate. Um, let's just bring in, uh, let's just bring in this gradient for right now. So I brought in this gradient. And what I'll do is I'll drop, drop that gradient right into the background of this image. So now I have, um, now I have this gradient behind the, the car, and I can do whatever I want with this gradient. I can move it down or move it up, and maybe now I have complete creative control over the size, um, over the, the highlight. Um, I can put drop shadows. I can put text in here. I can do call outs and, and talk about the part breakup of the image that I have. So um, that's what's nice about the TIFF image, that it gives us this alpha channel to be able to use in, other, in, the 2D, in a 2D tool. And uh, that's what I wanted to focus on here. Also, just know that also the other option you have is you can actually save out a PSD file. So we actually can save out a Photoshop file, a native Photoshop file. So if I'll just type in test six here, it's going to go ahead and render out this um, Photoshop file. I've got the PSD file, native file, and it will automatically break out the layers for me. I'll go ahead and say open. Here I go, test six. Now I have this file here that's completely broken out automatically. So just know that's the difference here. I will go ahead and make a new layer here and move this guy up. And we'll just drop a black background there. Now I have a separate um, element that I can control the background, the shadow color, and the geometry, excuse me, and the model. So that is the, the benefit of rendering out a PSD and or a TIFF image. You have complete creative control over each uh, element in the scene. Now let's talk about um, creating our own backgrounds. Um, that seems to be uh, one of the requests we get quite a bit 
is that uh, I don't have access to HDRs and we're a small shop and we want to be able to um, create some compelling looking imagery, but I don't have a screen on camera. What I'd like to do now is uh, switch over to, um, I'm on uh, Google, of course, here, and what, I, what I've typed in is this word here. It's called equirectangular images. So this is a, um, a format of an image that basically represents um, a 360-degree panoramic image and 180 degrees from the, from the North Pole to the South Pole of a sphere. So if you go online, these are basically uh, JPEGs. And I'm not supporting that you uh, plagiarize or steal, but for the sake of this demonstration, I wanted to just illustrate that an equirectangular image is a 360-degree left-to-right panoramic and a 180 degrees from the North Pole to the South Pole image. And what we can do is load these images um, into Showcase um, to give us our reflections on the body side. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we are, we're back live inside the session. And of course, I, um, I, I purchased this uh, background. Um, this one, I think, was from, um, I think, MOF, M-O-O-F-E, was one of the websites uh, where we purchased some, uh, some high-res backplate and um, HDI 360 panoramic for the background. I'm going to switch over to a, a generic environment. So the generic environment is, is the environment that allows you to create your own environments from scratch. So out of the box, um, not very exciting, but let's, let's make it exciting here. So what we can do is change what we see in the background. So here's the environment that I have, and I'll just right click on that and say duplicate. So now I have a copy of my original, and I'll just go ahead and name this, and I'll just call this custom. So now that I've got this custom background, I'm going to go to properties. Traditionally, I would go and load and launch an HDR image and extract the three um, um, reflection, diffuse, and specular images from that HDR. Um, but in this case, I'm going to go ahead and just do two things. So the first thing I'm going to do here is just say, when I go to ray trace, don't use, look at this background. Actually use the physical environment as my reflection. So what we see in the background and what the car sees are two different things. The car sees those three masks, the diffuse reflection and highlight. And then us as the viewer, we see this background image that's mapped or a ramp that's mapped to a piece of geometry. So what we're going to do is switch from the default setting, use reflection lighting map, to use environment shape. And I'll go ahead and turn on ray tracing. So I'll hit the letter R for ray tracing. You'll see our little status bar in the bottom right hand corner will start to creep up, and based on whatever settings we have set, uh, it'll you know, take that time to uh, resolve the final image based on um, how many subsamples that we've chosen for the ray tracer. So um, the ray tracing is turned, turned on, and what I'm going to do now is load a image in the background. Well, just to show you the, uh, the idea here is that if I change the scale of this object, Scale, scale the, the size of the environment. Um, I see that my, um, of course, my geometry is getting closer to the to the wall here, but um, I can scale that environment pretty easily. Um, so just know that when we switch from the, the reflection maps to the environment shape, notice how the paint looks a little bit different because it's actually seeing all this gray in the sky. Uh, the only other setting that I want to set here is right here where it says use lighting, override the panoramic. So in this case, I'll go ahead and select that and go to um, my desktop here. Actually, I have a folder in here, I believe. We'll go ahead and uh, switch over to um, the panel, and I'll say open. So it's going to switch over to that JPEG that we that we just selected. Excuse me, let's try that one more time. My mistake, we are live here. None of this is uh, pre-canned, so go ahead and grab this pano that I just loaded. I'll say open. So it's taking that pano, panoramic image, which is 180 degrees 
by 300, uh, excuse me, 180, so North Pole to South Pole at 360 degrees. So if we look here at the geometry, we can see that now we're actually using the environment to reflect on the body site. And it's not an HDR, and we just loaded an image in the background. So what this does is gives us complete creative control to be able to create our own backgrounds, even though they're not a true HDR. Yeah, we'll have to play with the exposure a little bit. Maybe we'll push this up a little bit. The image in the background, of course, that will force the, the highlight on the geometry to be a little bit higher. So knowing that you can create and load your own images in the background using the generic environment and switching the ray tracing properties from the user reflection lighting map to the physical and world, now you'll be able to load and create your own environments and lighting scenarios that you like. So again, as we see the background, we see some, um, some I'll say, smearing of pixels or bending of the image, a low-res image onto a high onto the geometry. So this would be the case where we actually would take um, a high-res backplate and load it um, in Photoshop. So um, just to give you a, a sample with that, again, what we did in Photoshop, um, where we took those layers and broke them out, we would load the high-res backplate in this layer and then output the vehicle, um, the vehicle that we just were just looking at. And we can, again, um, add and, and control the lighting as we need to do so. So another uh, uh, thing I wanted to highlight, I wanted to focus on is being able to create compelling um, camera views. And um, of course, you can create shots inside a showcase. And we set up a few camera views a little bit earlier. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch to a different environment right now. This is kind of just a generic, clean um, studio lighting scenario. Um, depending on the drama that you're going for, this highlight might be a little hot. Um, for some, it might be just right. And uh, just know that you have creative control to adjust that lighting as needed. So in this background that you're seeing, I loaded an image that I created in Photoshop. So some, something as simple as, um, I'll switch over here. Let's go ahead and close this one. I'll say no, close that. And in this scenario, um, I'll close these. Um, the image needs to be a 2 to 1 aspect ratio. So uh, two long and one tall. And you can load whatever you'd like in there. And so in this case, I'll just go ahead and flood fill it white. All right, I like that. And then I'll just save this out as a PNG file. All right, so we'll save this as a PNG. And I'll just call this white. All right, and I'm feeling good about that. We'll go ahead and say save. All right, we'll say OK. Now back in Showcase. Um, again, I'm on this environment here that I've created using just a Photoshop um, image in the background. And I'll go to Properties. And again, I'll just load that 2D image in the background. So I'll go here where it says uh, Show More Controls. And I'll just load it, uh, that white image that I just created on the desktop. So here we go. We'll say White and say Open. I'll go ahead and just kind of move this out of the way so you can see the screen. All right, so we're hardware shaded right now. And let's talk about the shadow real quick. I know people like to. Uh, kind of get the shadows looking right, and I do too. So we go to the scene setting and say environment lights and shadows. So currently, we have a pretty hard edge here um, on the ground. And there's two ways that we can adjust the shadow. Well, of course, right now we're in a hardware shading uh, preview window. So if I slide this up, um, that softens up that shadow on the ground. And also the intensity. Um, shadows are uh, quite often never all the way black. So I tend to sample from the image um, color here, and then I'll, I'll find out the color. You know, if I had a photograph in the background, I would sample from the darkest thing in the scene, and then kind of drag that down uh, and get it close. But so we're hardware shading now. But let's go ahead and switch over to ray tracing mode. So when we ray trace, we have a few other attributes that we get to play with. And the important thing in here is that we have two shadows. We have the direct light source shadow. So if we have a spotlight above us or the light source from the HDR is coming at us from kind of the uh, 4 o'clock position in the sky, of course, we can adjust that shadow here. So the ray tracing is kicking, kicking on. Um, again, I just want to reiterate that I'm using a 
um, one workstation with one video card. Um, uh, it's a, a Quadra FX 5600 in video card, and my H, it's an HP Z800 workstation, and I've got a Cintiq hooked up to it. So that's how I'm, I'm working currently. All right, so um, just, just know that that's kind of uh, the hardware that I'm running and uh, no big uh, server or cluster, although Showcase will run on a cluster. So looking here at the floor here, we see this ambient shadow distance. So this is a big thing that helps kind of anchor, helps the human eye anchor the, um, the object into a scene kind of as obscure and arbitrary as this one. And um, also the shadow and highlight softness. So if I slide this all the way down, this has to do with the direct light in the scene. So this should now give us a pretty crisp edge all the way around, um, all the way around the, uh, the model. We get a hard line edge. And once that revs up, now you can see that as it starts to resolve up. Let me uh, change the, the ray tracing to be just fast for right now. So we can see this a little quicker while we're, while we're working on this scene. And so now as I slide this up, you can see that shadow will kind of soften a little bit. And depending if we have a really hard light source, of course, that would be hard. And then just as a, as a little tip here, you can actually type in a, a higher value than what that slider will go to. And it kind of helps soften and anchor this. And it feels like it's more like in a, light, um, a lighting, automotive lighting uh, studio. Now, the ambient shadow distance, just to give you a heads up, this is not, has nothing to do with the actual light source. This has to do with the geometry's proximity to the physical world. So as I slide this up here, the body side is recognizing the floor, and the floor is recognizing the body side. Um, it's looking out 100 and currently 150 um, uh, centimeters out, and you see that's why we see these speckles way out here. When you're rendering, for those of you that are showcase users, if you're seeing this uh, spottiness or salt and pepper look on screen, just know uh, that the ray tracing settings, so if you hit the letter R, of course, it brings up this ray tracing status window. And when you hit this settings window, um, I want to draw your attention to two areas. One here is this cube where you see these spots on the floor. This has to do with the resolution of the shadow on the floor. The next icon down is this sphere that looks like it's salt and peppered on the sphere. This has to do with the ambient occlusion fidelity that's on the geometry. So for instance, I see this is a little bit spotty. If I drag this up a little bit, and also well, we'll just let, let that kind of resolve, you'll notice that that starts to smooth out. Um, depending on the resolution that you're looking at on your screen, just know that this setting has to do with shadows on the ground, and this setting right here has to do with the ambient shadows that are calculated on the geometry. So that's just a nice, uh, little note for self. When I'm working in real time and setting up my shots and angle finding, um, I'll let the subsamples go up to like one or four, and you'll notice that I get a pretty fast uh, interaction while ray tracing. Um, for the final output images, I don't go past 16. Um, for large, large images like um, 8,000 by um, uh, 16,000, I don't go over 64, but just know that four to 16 are pretty good for uh, regular 20-foot board presentations. And as far as these sliders go here, the ambient inclusion and global illumination, um, depending on the kind of time you have to wait, I tend not to go above 30 on either one of those. So knowing now how to control the shadow and that the ambient inclusion shadow is separate than the scene light shadow, um, you'll have quite a bit of control here. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the shot. So once you've set up the paint and you set up decals, if we look at the um, if you look at the side tire here, how do I get images looking fairly realistic? Um, I'm actually using a photograph here mapped to that geometry. And same thing here for like the, uh, the reflect um, detail here inside this side um, marker. I'll go ahead and hide that geometry. And if I hit the, the material properties here, you'll see that I just loaded a photograph um, that I found online. And uh, just kind of went into Photoshop or my 2D editor, Sketchbook designer, and edited out so that uh, I didn't have any, any other data that I didn't need. So here we are. And uh, I'll go ahead and switch now out to my um, clean um, studio setting. And I think right now I actually have a floor that I see. I'll right on the floor here. 
And I'll go ahead and hit ray tracing. So now we'll have a little bit of a, a, a reflection on the ground, if that's a look that you like to have. So I, I just brought in a, a flat plane and um, gave it a transparency and also um, put on a little bit of a blurred reflection. And a blurred reflection kind of gives it that brushed metal look. So it's not an exact mirror on the floor. So I'm going to go ahead and show you. Um, so this is this is the uh, the result of that. So I've got that floor that I brought in, and you can output the um, the geometry or the 2D image as needed. Let's go ahead and jump to shots. So shots again, as we noted a little bit earlier, are quick bookmarks of particular camera views that are striking and that you want to use in your presentation. How do you create a, a shot? Again, this that was a control T. So let's say that we want to add some motion to one of these shots. Um, and to do that, I'll go ahead and say create a start to end uh, shot here. Let's say start here, and let's just go ahead and rotate around to the side. I'll say reset the end. Let's have that happen over five seconds, and let's go ahead and preview that. All right, so just know that you can adjust the timing of that playback, and it might be a little bit delayed on your screen, but just know that you can adjust the transition time and also just cut to the shot instead of fading through black. So that's how you create an animated shot. Well, there's cases where you want to have a much more controlled camera. Sometimes if I start the front of the vehicle and roll to the back end, the camera kind of finds its own way to get to the back end, and it's not very controlled. What I'd like to show you now is a, a camera that I created um, in Mac. So here's a camera move where I'm staying, staying looking at the point of interest here, the headlamps, the jewelry at the front end. And the playback speed might be a little bit delayed on your end. Just know that uh, um, this is a very controlled uh, camera pass. And um, I have one other one here that will play. We're going to start from the front of the vehicle. We're going to kind of, I'm looking at the interior. So this is a, a much more controlled camera path here, not just an arbitrary start and end and let the in-between frame sort out itself. So I went into 3ds Max. And um, how I got there was is that I actually saved out my showcase file as an FBX file. So I can save out my file as an FBX format. And when I went to 3ds Max, I'll show you what we have here. Let's go ahead and minimize um, showcase here and jump into Max. So now I'm in 3ds Max. I brought the file in via an FBX file. And for those of you uh, that are, are Maya users, this is the same operation. You'll bring it in as an FBX file. So this FBX file format is the film box format. And it brings over geometry, cameras, and the kind of the uh, rough assignments of the material that you had brought over. In the scene here, I have set up a uh, kind of a keyframe. I started at the left here. And you can see my camera is right here. And I've turned on trajectory so you can see the camera's kind of the path of the camera. And let me just hit the letter H here and then select my camera, make sure my camera is active, and I'll turn on and off that trajectory. And you can see here's this path that the camera is going to follow. And when I scrub through my little animation here, in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see this is the path that I want it to follow. All right, I like that. And once uh, my camera is active, I'm going to give it a name here. I'll call it uh, New Camera. All right, very descriptive name. And uh, we'll go ahead and say File. And the only thing I'm going to output is this, this camera. So we'll say File, Export, Export Selected. And not the geometry, but just this camera. So it's called New Camera. And uh, let's just see, I'll drop it here on my organized desktop. I'll just call this New Camera. And here it is. And I'll say Save. This is the same operation you'll do in Maya as well. I've saved out this new camera. I'm going to crank back over into Showcase. And now I want to import that camera. So I'll go ahead and hide my environments to kind of reduce some of the screen clutter. So if you don't have this T, uh, uh, Shots editor up at the bottom, again, that's just the letter T, and it's a toggle. And I'm going to toggle off that ray tracing setting. That's the letter Y. So now I'm going to say, uh, right here where it says Shots, I'm going to left mouse click and say import from file. So this will give me the ability to now import that custom camera. And I'll say import from files. And I'll say import from files. 
And so we'll look here and it says new camera. There it is. And we'll say import. Excuse me, open. And you'll notice right away it'll say new camera. This is what we're going to import in the frames per second that we came that came over from from Max. Uh, in this case, we're 30 frames a second. And I'll say okay. You'll notice now that it gets tagged on to the end of the shot lister. So here at the very end here is my new camera. And this is the camera that I set up and you know I focused on this parting line and this new headlamp uh, design and the details around that. So again, uh, that is how I created these other two uh, camera views. So we can scroll through shots. You can also set hotkeys. So you'll see that I have set a few hotkeys here, the letter zero, the number zero. We'll follow me through that camera. Um, number nine here, I set one up, and that's just a right click and set a hotkey. So I'll hit the number nine here, and here is another um, shot that I set up. So that's how you set up shots. Um, you can get pretty creative with the shot cameras, but if you need very controlled and very direct camera paths, I'd recommend coming in from Maya or Max. Um, via the FBX file format. The next thing I want to show you is uh, during a real-time presentation, uh, sometimes we need to show um, my vehicle uh, up against the competitor's vehicle. And something that makes uh, that easy to, to show differences of center line sections, of uh, cross sections through the Oscar set, or uh, typical sections, is something called the cross section. So, I'll go ahead and bring up the cross-section tool, and that's the letter X for cross-section. And I'm going to go ahead and say create a cross-section plane. So what's going to happen now is I'll go ahead and uh, you'll see that the cross-section plane will come on screen here. And uh, we can already see right away that it's cutting uh, our vehicle in half. So I'm going to type in uh, 90 here by just typing on the uh, little half egg shape, that little ellipse shape there. And now we can see through the vehicle, and we can see the section and the stack up. So we can bring in multiple models and look at the sections here. If we want to go to a uh, um, kind of a dead side view, an orthographic view here, let's go ahead and um, deselect all that and get in here and look at this. So now I can use that um, dead side orthographic view to look at my section. I can highlight the section properties, so I can say, the properties of that cross section. Let's say let's put our vehicle in green, okay, and uh, we can put the competitors in the blue or whatever. So just know that we can have multiple cross sections. Um, in addition to that, um, just know that we can also go to and flip what side you want to keep. So let's say we, I just have now engaged the uh, um, flip section. So now it's the other side that's been clipped away. And we can, again, just select the geometry and pass through um, the geometry. And you can have multiple cross-sections um, displayed. So you can just show a portion through the 2700 line or whatever it is that you're trying to uh, evaluate. So that's cross-sections. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, just delete that for right now. You can save that. You can also animate cross-sections passing through the geometry. One of the final things I wanted to touch on here is when you're presenting and, and really trying to sell your story and getting your vision across uh, to your design uh, community or your managers is um, selling the story and setting the mood for um, showcase or excuse me for your design. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and select the uh, something called a, sl a slide. Now, slides <coughs> are something that are, are part of what's called a storyboard. And you create empty slides, and you load those slides with the environment that you want to show, the paint that you want to show, the model that you want to show, and any animation that you'd like to show. So uh, the letter U here brings up the um, storyboard editor. And to create a slide, it's, it's pretty much just like this. So we'll go ahead and say to create a storyboard slide. And um, in this case, I'm going to say, in this situation, I want to right click and say, add this environment to the storyboard slide. And I'm going to go over to my paints by hitting the letter A. And let's, say, let's bring in this bright blue. And I'll say Add to Current Storyboard Slide. And let's actually add this camera view, Add to Current Storyboard Slide, and maybe this one here, Add to Current Storyboard Slide. So you can add multiple variants 
um, in a storyboard slide uh, deck. And then let's go ahead and just say um, set the image here. So I know what that slide looks like. By adding paint, models, and positional alternatives along with shots in your custom environments, the storyboard presentation of complex variants becomes very um, compelling. So let's go ahead and start this out here. And I've also um, assigned a hotkey to that. So we can actually present this full screen or borderless. So I can uh, hide you know, everything. And also looking at is the real geometry. Ultimately, you would want to ray trace out all these images or even output a quick time or a, a flash video, which now you can do. You can output a flash, um, flash file of all of your slides. So here we go, passing through the slide here, and I'm going to go ahead and switch to the next slide. So I'll just um, switch to the next slide. Notice it changes the paint, it changes the geometry, and it changes the environment. And now it's going through the shots that are currently in that slide deck. So again, when you ray trace out all this, um, you can ray trace them out as single images and composite them in whatever compositing uh, software you'd like to use. Or you can output them as just uh, um, AVIs or uncompressed uh, movie Microsoft format. This becomes very uh, a nice presentation tool. And hotkey will on the keypad, so you don't have to have any interface up at all. Uh, control space bar makes you go full screen. And then the last slide here, control and arrow. Now this is our last slide that we had just set up. And uh, we'll go ahead and you can see that it's, it's switching over. I'll bring up that, and I'll just say, roll tape. I'll say, play. Here goes our, our last slide. And if we look what's in the slide, we see that we have two views here. <laughs> Remember that you can output all of these as a flash animation. And with that, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up and uh, start the uh, question and answer session. All right, Kevin. Well, thank you very much for this brilliant presentation. It was really interesting to see. Um, it was really amazing, actually, to see what you could do with camera angles and custom panning shots. And pretty much everything that, you, that you've been through was really very interesting to see. Um, so we just, I wanted to do a couple of questions here that come through. Um, can you, can you, I think you may have touched upon this actually, but can you go through and let us know what files Showcase can read? Uh, absolutely. Let's go ahead and look at that. I'll go ahead and um, go File, Import Models, and in the bottom right-hand corner, um, on, I don't know if you can see this, but the, it says uh, we read CATIA files natively. We read um, ProE file, Granite files, that's the newer ProE file format. We read that natively. We read JT files. Um, um, yes, we read uh, uh, yeah, the translator, the UGNX file, the .prt file format, and most of the open source file formats as well. Right, and, and you mentioned that all of this can be done in, in regular showcase as well. Uh, that's correct. The only thing uh, that the professional gives you is the ability to do stereo, to host sessions, um, to do um, kind of a VR room uh, support. So that's kind of the higher end. Um, but from everything I've shown you today is all uh, doable in the uh, uh, showcase, not professional. Okay. Okay. Um, and can showcase run on a cluster? Um, actually, yeah, showcase can run on a cluster. Uh, if you just have to enable it. Uh, let's see, we're going to go here to uh, rate tracing cluster preferences. Um, you call the cluster IP and the port that you want to use for your cluster, and you'll get your bank of machines set together, and uh, away you go. Right. So what, what images can, uh, can showcase render out well then? Um, we uh, touched on it just a little bit earlier, but uh, when you're hardware shading, you have the ability to output, again, a native Photoshop file, a bitmap, a TIFF, and a JPEG. Um, when you're ray tracing, you ability to um, save out um, TIFFs with HDR, so uh, JPEG, TIFF, uh, HDR, so you can load that in your back environment, um, BMP, and HDR. Okay. Um, somebody wants to know, can you put 
Can you put out a quick time or flash movie? Um, yeah, uh, we mentioned that just there towards the end there, the, um, using the storyboard slides, we can output um, these movies as a uh, flash, you can output a flash movie from the slide deck. So each one of these you can output as a flash movie with the um, variant. So you can put the interface at the top or the bottom of the flash and give it a name. Um, you can use your you know, hotkeys and also uh, you know, you'll see the thumbnails inside the Flash file. Uh, quality settings, and just poke that and save it out as a Flash movie, and that's distributed on the web or just, you know, attached to an email. Okay, do you have, um, somebody recently uh, asked us, could you demo the stereo mode that you, uh, that you mentioned Pro can, uh, can demonstrate? Um, that's a, a good question. Well, because we're over the web, um, basically, what you'll need to do is go to the plugin manager here. So this is the plugin manager, and here in the plugin manager, um, we have listed um, all the kind of um, custom um, settings that we allow you to do, and also you know custom scripts that you want to create. And we have the stereo uh, plugin selected here. So view in stereo mode. So this would be the attribute that you would say um, you would need to load. I, I need reload or restart my machine here, but um, you can say remove these from the plugin manager or add, and then once you did that, um, you'll do the stereo mode and turn on stereo mode um, with the screen. And, and the, the settings that you'll do is not the eye point for the stereo mode, but uh, yes, you can do. Uh, we can adjust the eye point um, of you know the viewer's eye. I should say dial that in. Okay. I hope that satisfies you, uh, their panelists. Uh, can you can you import or export SK, the SKP or 3DS format? Um, can I export the um, um, native? Can you import uh, and export or export them? Um, currently, our um, file export uh, abilities are the native auto as packet file and the FBX uh, file format. Okay. So and can you so you can't export an SLV file either? Um, ex, uh, an SLV file um, that would be you know the only way that I would know to do that would be to um, just use the flash uh, the flash creation from the slides. But no no native just save that as an SLV. Okay. Are there are there any graphic card settings for the stereo mode? Uh, yes, there are some settings in the, uh, depending on what video card you have, of course the drivers are going to uh, depict what those settings are, but uh, if I switch over to my desktop here, I'm not going to go into all that, but yes, you can uh, um, dial in those settings. So set up stereo 3D, and you enable stereoscopic, stereoscopic um, and uh, have at it. Okay. Um, another question has just come in. Is it possible to add positional and model alternatives in a storyboard slide? For example, can we toggle between different designs of alloy wheels in a single storyboard slide, and how? Um, yes, you can. Uh, let's see. So, so load different geometry in. Um, yeah, what you would need to do is go ahead and load your geometry in the alternative uh, um, model mode. So we'll go here where it says create, we'll say model lineup. What we do is uh, select, say, let's just, you know, in, in this case, we'll select this, this wheel. This wheel here. Make sure that I'm not uh, in uh, presentation mode here. All right, here we go. Turn that off, and I'll select this wheel. Something's hogging. Here we go. Select tire. <laughs> yeah, basically, load your geometry in the scene, uh, in your alternative. And once you created a new slide, uh, let's see. Go ahead and create a new slide. Here. Once you create a new slide, um, you right-click on your alternative for a model lineup. Um, so you'll switch through the different models not paints and not positional, but it'll show theme A, theme B, theme C, 
in the slide. I have two things talking. I'm going to go ahead and shut down Max real quick here. Exit. Exit Max. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to point out that uh, made me think about the uh, showing variance. Um, once you've set up your alternatives and your storyboard slides and you've gone to a full-size, uh, full-screen mode, just know that we have something called presentation mode. And in presentation mode, we can set up something called a 3D trigger. In this case, um, to be able to show, um, I, I'm going to show you two alternatives. In this case, notice that my icon has, looks a little bit different. Uh, it's kind of like the circular arrow, but when I move over this fender, I select that fender, and it, what it's going to do is change the paint. So I've made this fender a trigger to, to, to um, switch a different paint. If I go to this fender, you'll notice that there's a little hand there, and I select that fender, and the paint should switch over to, um, we should have red and gray here. My machine's being bizarre. Let's try that again. Uh, but yeah, you can set up 3D triggers. So, so if you, can you also physically direct the paint swatches into show um, at, Yes, you can inter physically interact with the paint swatches. Um, I'll select everything with this material. Just right click, hit the M key for materials, and um, you can load. Uh, you, I have a bunch of materials that I've been using and, and storing, uh, ones that I like, good paint, good uh, uh, material descriptions, and then I can just quickly throw those onto a part um, I'll go ahead and just make this um, let's just make this black here. And so yeah, you can modify the material. Um, we have the predefined, but now we can go ahead and massage and modify the image or the materials to to the likings of the the art direction. So um, I can push that up a little bit, a little more IBL, a little more of the environment light on that. We can play with the the, um, the reflectivity, the kind of the Fresnel effect here. Well, as I pull that down, that spike up here, as the surface rolls off, becomes more mirror-like over the edge. You have direct manipulation and complete control of, over all the materials. That's great. So um, just a, a few more questions here, I think. Um, can you import camera data from Max or Maya? I think you may have touched upon that earlier. Yeah, we sure can. Um, for those of you that were on just a little bit earlier, we, we were in Max. Um, I have brought in a camera. We can bring in any kind of camera, adjust all the timing, and uh, you know, adjust the ease in and ease out in, in Max or in Maya, whatever you're most adept in, and uh, get those real complex animations. And just as a side note, you can also uh, you can also use um, animate your vehicle inside of Max from F to do very complex animations. Um, of course, in Showcase, you can just do simple turntables and some uh, keyframe animation. If you of a great vehicle, you can definitely bring in those animations to Showcase. All right. Um, so I think the final question, this one's a, a technical one. How many polygons can it handle in one scene? Well, I see. I, on my little laptop, I've got an M... Uh, uh, 35, sorry, a 4,500 uh, laptop, and I start to hit the limit of being able to use the scene. Um, you know, I, my frame rate drops down to like 0.1. If I get anything over 10 million polygons, um, in this case, I've got a. I'm working on a desktop, and I've got um, quite a few polys here. Right now, I'm currently at about 7 million polygons, and I, I'd say on a, on a file, you know, up to you know, 20 to 30 million polygons is when you start to get pretty low frame rates. So if you're working in a real-time uh, real presentation. So um, it, it can handle pretty big data sets. And uh, um, stay tuned for the newer version of Showcase. We've uh, really increased the abilities to uh, bring in large, large data sets. So thank you. And this, uh, and, and this um well, are there any plans for showcase to use a different ray tracing engine? Um, that's a great question. Um, uh, for for those of you that might have attended one of the Autodesk uh, Automotive Days, uh, Ken Pimentel, who's kind of our um, lead um, uh, visualization uh, product manager, 
um, has, has hinted that the iRay uh, product that you see inside of Max might be utilized in some of our other Viz products, but uh, we're waiting to see uh, um, with bated breath to see the iRay kind of populate through other. Okay, there's a, there's a couple more questions. I think we've got time for a few more. Um, has AutoRed been tested in parallel on the Mac platform, or is it likely to run natively on Macs in the future? Then, um, I'll just uh, what I can what I can speak to is that uh, AutoRed is very uh, very committed to the uh, the Mac platform, and as you've seen with uh, you know AutoCAD and Inventor. Um, and alias on the Mac, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see it sometime soon. Okay. And do, are there, do you have any suggestions for codec of movie output? Um, someone saying the file size is huge and there's no compression. Um, I tend to uh, do, uh, for, for me, when, I'm, when, when we're working on uh, outputting in movies, we usually tend to just do the uh, a JPEG or TIFF and, and do them um, with a compositing software, like you, if you want to use Movie Maker or you know After Effects or uh, Premiere, whatever it is, um, there's the uncompressed file format and then the compressed. Um, right now, those are the only codecs that are available to you right currently. And is, is there a limit to the number of triggers that can be set? Um, I haven't run into one. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, can I use GeForce card for stereo mode? Kyle wants to know. No, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't know that answer. I, I typically run on NVIDIA. Um, I guess my recommendation to you is to uh, make sure you go check the qualified charts. Um, let's see if we have one here. Certified hardware. If you go to the help docs and go to your certified hardware, it will give you a list of um, kind of optimized cards and ones that we've, we've tested and know that are that are pretty solid. So if I can just recommend that, you go ahead and go to the Help Docs and Certified Hardware. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for us now, Kevin. I thank you so much for joining us. And um, thanks to uh, everyone else as well, all of our participants, for joining us today. Um, this webinar is going to be uploaded into our archives and accessible in the future. So all of your colleagues who haven't been uh, able to attend this live presentation, they can access this and indeed any previous webinar under the process tab in the Car Design News homepage. So thanks again for joining us today, and we hope that you'll join us again for our next webinar. Thanks again, Kevin. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.